we'll kick off the first presentation here. Um, the first is going to be uh, titled The Facts of Light by Tulio Dell'Aquila. Um, Tulio has been a professional lighting designer for well over a decade. His pioneering work with high power LEDs spans numerous commercial, automotive, and aquarium applications. During his career, he has designed and manufactured lighting products for many of the top companies in our industry. His dedication and innovation has helped pave the way for aquarium lighting as we know it today. I introduce to you Mr. Tulio. Yes, sir. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody to MACNA. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to thank the uh, club, the Buyer Reef Keeping. Great job, guys. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about light. I'm sure a lot of us have read numerous articles on lighting, talks on lighting. A lot of times, I like to talk, uh, start my presentation or talk with a couple of questions. One, uh, in terms of lighting, how many people here, just raise your hand, how many people here are using LEDs? Wow, that's a big change. I started talking about lighting probably about 15 years ago, um, and if I asked that same question, not one single hand would be raised. Um, okay, now, how many people are using T5? We got any T5 users in the audience? Okay, yeah, they're still hanging in there. And lastly, here's the big one, here's the big one. How many people still use metal halides? Okay, great. I ask these questions because obviously you see on social media, some of the boards, you know, there's always these, oh, LED or halide. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna factually compare light because there is no best. It's all about the utilization of light, understanding light. So with that, I'm gonna ask you a simple question. What is light? Anybody wanna to try to tackle that question for me? What is light? Go ahead. Okay, you know what? Excellent answer. Because when you ask people what light is, a lot of times we've heard a lot about light, but we don't really know what it is. Simply put, light is either quanta or photons. These are packets of energy. So what you need to understand is that when you're turning on your light, whether it's an LED, a metal halide, T5, you're imparting energy into your aquarium. The reason for the importance of this talk is that after today, with some of the basic information that I'm going to be giving you, which again is based on fact, there is no sp speculation here, you'll see things as they come up in the talk, uh, you will now become ambassadors. The reason why it's important to have these ambassadors for light is the only way we can go forward is to get away from things of the past. We're still talking about wattage. We're still talking about Kelvin. We're still talking about PAR. Once you understand these things through the evolution of my talk, if you will, all of these things will really start to make sense. And then you, we will realize how much work we have to do because we have to get away from these things in order to go forward. Why? Because more than your corals rely and depend on light in your aquaria. There are numerous phototropic organisms, very important ones, that are also equally, if not more, dependent on the light in your system than your corals. And these guys are often the natural food. They also help with the biological health of your system. They play numerous, very critical roles. So while you're manipulating your lighting to make the corals happy, we have to look at the big picture because there's more than just the corals. So let me get started with my talk. Um, obviously, my name's Tulio Delaquila. They great job introducing me. I would have hired me after that introduction. Here's an aquarium. I don't know how many of you folks are familiar with Advanced Aquarist. This tank is from 2003. This was probably one of the very first aquariums ever lit completely with LED. And this was in 2003. It's using a couple of moonlights and a couple of five watt Luxians. I actually built the lighting and this tank 
I set it up in my hotel room at one of the trade conferences, and it was hysterical because we had a line of people coming in and out looking at this, you know, amazing new technology. Um, I'm going to point out Bob over there, Bob Fenner. I'm sure many of you guys know Bob. Bob remembers when I started giving my first talks on LEDs. And back then, we really didn't know what to make of the technology because it was so new. And obviously, it's evolved. But here's the interesting thing. While the technology may has evolved, the needs of the corals haven't. OK? I've been doing lighting talks for a long time. And it was funny, when I was putting this presentation together, I started sounding like a broken record to myself because the things I'm saying today are essentially many of the things that I said 15 years ago. Why? Because the science doesn't change. The needs of corals don't change, OK? So how many people here are familiar with the term Kelvin? Let's get started with Kelvin. We're going to have fun with that one. If I were to say, I'm, going to, I'm sorry, since you're in the front, I'm going to point you out a lot. If I had a 65K metal halide lamp, what color would you tell me that this lamp is going to be? Like 6,000? 65K, 6,500K. Okay. Well, uh, yellow. Okay. Very that, yeah, very yellow. Very yellow. Hmm. I'm glad you said that. And by the way, this isn't your fault. Like the first well, no, but see, here's the interesting thing. Let's go to the next slide. Let's look at this picture, folks. This is anybody familiar with the ISO? Any machinists or other people? OK, here we go. We got an ISO guy here. Is it fair to say that the ISO knows what they're talking about? Well, I'm glad you said that, because here's the ISO standard for light. If we look, we see a couple of interesting things. 6500K is not yellow at all. In fact, we see some more interesting things. How many people here have been told that 10K is white? A lot of us, right? Guys, this is per the ISO. 10K is actually blue. And if we continue down this path, and boy, I get, trouble when I, I get in trouble when I say this, if we continue down this path, technically 20K doesn't even exist. OK? And if you were to look, if you go to Cree, Luxion, uh, any one of the sources for many LEDs and other light sources, Find me a 20K LED. Find me a 14K LED. They don't exist. They don't exist, OK? So this is why it's so important that we start moving forward. So now, how did we get into this mess in the first place? Here we go. Oh, here we go. The first measurement we're discussing is Kelvin. Kelvin is often used to describe the color temperature of light. Now, temperature is very important when we're discussing Kelvin. In our case, it refers to an emitting body of light in degrees Celsius. Most of us are familiar with an incandescent lamp, which has a filament, which is what we call a theoretical black body made of tungsten. As current begins to pass, the filament will begin to heat up. The amount, as the amount of ele electrons or current passing through the filament increases, it will start to glow, producing light. As you see, we use the latest technological equipment for this example. If you were to measure the temperature of the filament and note the color it's glowing, you now have a fundamental idea of how color temperature works. The reason Kelvin, as we just described it, does not work when measuring or categorizing the light output of, let's say, an LED is because LEDs and other lighting technologies popularly used in our industry do not use a black body or filament to emit light. See, when the Planckian locus in your black body curve was created in 1931, we had carbon lamps, we had incandescent lamps, OK? LEDs didn't exist, per se. They came into the picture probably in about the 60s. I'd say around the mid-60s. They were very expensive back then. But the point is, is when this Planckian locus and black body was created, it was created for incandescent sources. 
So if the light source is not incandescent, we can already see a problem there. There is also a physical reason why Kelvin, as we just described it, does not work when describing the light produced by lamps and other light sources. This is where it gets fun. Since T5 lamps are still so popular in our industry, I will use these as an example. The surface of the sun, here's, here's where we start with the facts. Well, the other stuff is facts too, but the surface of the sun is 6,000 K. Now I have a question for you. If we were to take those lights, this podium, that camera, anything in this room, for example, and put it on the surface of the sun, what would happen? It would vaporize, right? So here's my point. If these things would vaporize it on the surface of the sun at 6,000 K, how the heck can an LED or a lamp or anything else for that matter be 6,000 K, let alone 10,000 K or 14,000 K? Imagine if a T5 lamp reached a temperature of 10,000 K. You would not have to worry about the color of light or intensity because there would be no lamp left. The glass could not tolerate the temperatures. <laughs> While your lamp was vaporizing, your fixture would be going up in smoke as well. By now, I think you get the picture. Okay, since it's pretty clear why Kelvin is not how the color temperature of most light sources is determined, then how can we use Kelvin to denote the light produced by aquarium lamps? Here's where it gets. It's called color correlated temperature, CCT, and is also often used to express Kelvin. Theoretically, and here we go, theoretically, if you heated a black body to a given temperature, say 10,000 K without your lamp exploding, the color produced should probably look like this. If you're getting the feeling this sounds pretty vague, you're absolutely correct. And here's my question. How many people, maybe metal halide users, how is it that we can have two different 10K lamps, but yet they look completely different? Okay, how can we have all these different light sources? This one's 12K, this one's 10K, but when we put them side by side, they look completely different. To properly understand color correlated temperature, we need to go over a few basics. In truth, it's actually pretty simple. First, I want you to imagine a triangle. At the bottom left-hand corner of the triangle, we'll label that corner blue. Label the top of the triangle green and the remaining right-hand corner red. Now, if you have any corners left over, I don't know, you may want to go see a psychologist or something, but we'll just stick with these three corners for now. Now we will imagine a small circle in the center of the triangle, and in the center of that circle, we will put a dot. This is a very important dot. You do realize that if this were a television series, this would be the point where Mr. Saltwater says, tune in next week. This would be the cliffhanger, but fortunately, we're not gonna keep you guys hanging. The dot represents neutral white. See, here's the fascinating thing. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying this, but, but, but there's a lot of factual truth to how we're describing this triangle. What's so fascinating about this dot, neutral white, if you will, it's where blue, red, and green converge so that their color no longer exists. Now, here's another interesting thing that a lot of people don't realize, which makes this dot even more amazing. White is not a color. White is a shade. Do we have any photography people here? Anybody who work with grayscales, different things like that? White is not a color. So blue, red, and green converge, and now essentially they become invisible. They, they, they essentially cancel one another out. Now, if we were looking at it in terms of, let's say, a light source, the dominant wavelengths are still there. But when they converge, what we perceive is actually white light. Now, the other amazing thing about light that a lot of people may or may not realize is light is invisible. 
We do not see light. What we actually see is what's reflected or equally important, what's not absorbed. So when you look at your corals and other things in your aquarium, you can determine a lot <coughs> about actually what that coral is utilizing just by the colors you see. Because that, that light, you, you, you can see what's being reflected and absorbed, okay? Let's take gold. Some people here are wearing gold. Have you ever wondered why gold appears to us as yellow or yellowish? That's because it absorbs more blue light. Now, if you think about it, we take red and green, mix them together. What do we have? We start to get yellow. Okay, so now silver or white gold, however you want to look at it, it reflects nearly all light that strikes it. So you get that chrome kind of silver look. So again, in terms of color science or whatever, what you see, even though I tell people all the time the eye is a terrible judge of light, okay, what you see can still tell you a lot about what's going on. The circle that this amazing dot is located in the center of it represents white, or more correctly put it, the many variations of white light. If you were to move the dot in any direction within the circle, the corresponding color temperature would technically be considered white, but the appearance to the human eye would change dramatically. Now, before I move on, remember how we were talking about 65K and how it's not yellow? Anybody here ever went to Lowe's or Home Depot and purchased a cool white fluorescent lamp for their bathroom or their kitchen? If you were to look at the color temperature on that lamp, it's 5,000K. But I guess Sylvania or Phillips, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about when it comes to light, so obviously they're pulling our leg, right? So the appearance to the human eye would change dramatically. So as we move that dot around, we're still technically in what I call the white zone, but then you start to get your many variations. That's why with LEDs, for example, they use a macadam ellipse, and it's called binning. And depending on where they land, that's how they determine the usefulness of the particular LED. Oh, I think I went too far. Nope. Here we go. As with color correlated temperature, according to the chromaticity diagram, two light sources can have slightly different XY coordinates and still have identical color correlated temperatures. Now, to simplify this, imagine a simple vector. And this triangle kind of lives in the vector, okay? As you move X and Y, now, when, they, when they're looking at chromaticity, there's actually three values. There's Z, but Z is brightness, which is implied. So what starts to happen is you, when you add up X, Y, and Z, you'll end up at a value of 100. And this becomes important in my next statement. There's one small problem. Two light sources can complete, could, could appear completely different from one another to the human eye while the scrubbing the, oh, oh. So basically they can appear completely different, but technically they can have the same color temperature. Anybody here work in math with vectors or things like that? We got any mathematicians in the audience? Here you go. So as you know, we can move X and Y and we can still come up with a value of 100, correct? There you go. They'll have, so they'll look different to us, but they'll have the same color temperature. Describing and comparing the output of light sources is another thing entirely. And here's where it starts to get fun. Radiometric versus photometric. Come on. Since as far back as I can remember, hobbyists and professionals alike often use wattage when considering the output or suitability of a light source for aquarium use. As a result, our hobby has become fixated on wattage when comparing the output, including LEDs. Is this a fair statement? I'm not asking you guys to agree with me, but we use wattage to compare light sources, correct? I'm not making this stuff up. The bottom line is, is while wattage is often used to express the output of a light source, it represents the total amount of radiant energy produced. And everything that I'm describing here, by the way, also includes LEDs. The amount of energy is actually less than the amount of electrical energy consumed, 
also expressed in watts. Have you noticed anything yet? In neither of these statements has there been any mention about how much light is actually being produced, let alone its usability for our application in, in this instant reef aquariums. Here we go. If anybody has a little piece of paper and wants to jot this down or take a screenshot of this, this is basic Ohm's law, but I've converted it so that you can now use watts, amps, volts. Now, how many people here have heard that LEDs use so much less power than LEDs? Raise a hand, guys, don't worry, we're not gonna single you out. Bunch of us, okay? Well, here's the question. Since I seen you nodding your head when you seen the Ohm's Law formula, and I was talking to Alex from, from Abyss as well, the amazing thing about this formula is it not only applies to power and ohms, but it can also be utilized for things like fluid dynamics. So this is a, this is a factual formula that we can use. So here's the thing. If I had a 100 watt LED fixture, that would be up in the top, P. Well, let's say 120, because it'll make the math simple. I have a 120 watt LED fixture, that's P on top. I'm using 120 volts at my outlet. When I divide, I'm gonna use one amp. That's what I'm gonna use, one amp. So here's my question. If I had a 100 watt metal halide, a 120 watt metal halide, and I'm using 120 volts at the wall, how much power am I gonna use? One amp, one amp. And there's a reason for this. Hopefully we can get past, here we go. Okay, this is because while wattage indicates the radiant energy produced and or consumed by a light source, only a small percentage of that energy is in the visible region where human vision and photosynthesis occurs. Even less is available as photosynthetically active radiation, commonly known as PAR. The rest of the radiant energy produced, depending on the light source, is UV, infrared, and thermal infrared. This is why aquarium lamps, and yes, even LEDs, can produce so much heat during operation. The percentage of UV, visible light, infrared, and heat radiated can vary greatly depending on the light source. I'll give you an example. Let's take the good old fashioned incandescent lamp. We've all heard how inefficient incandescent lamps are, right? But here's the interesting thing. If your application required infrared, you can't get a more efficient source than an incandescent lamp because over 90% of that energy is being converted to infrared. So see, it's a matter of semantics and the light source you're using for the given application. <coughs> so as you can see, the radiometric output or wattage of a light source gives us little information about the amount of visible light produced or its usefulness for photosynthesis. Here's an example some black body radiation. As you can see, there's a lot of other light. Only a small band of that is actually visible or UV. Here's another example. So again, that, that, that rainbow band that you see is basically what we're utilizing. In fact, here's something interesting. In our industry, we typically look at four to 700 nanometers when we're discussing something like PAR, is that correct? If you look at horticulture, there's certain industries that actually go up to 800 nanometers because there's utilization beyond, beyond 700 nanometers, okay? Oh. Come on. Before we move on, I'd like to point out a couple of things regarding wattage and light sources. The output of any light source, including LEDs, is solely dependent on the efficiency of the fixture system it is housed in and the control gear, gear ballast and other electronics used for its operation. For example, 
When you see the specifications for an LED, any of you DIY guys, that's that LED operating in a perfect world. Once you remove it from that environment and install it into a fixture, a lot of things start to happen. Now you're looking at thermal management because if the LED gets hot, you start to get an effect known as droop, where you're basically producing more heat and less visible light, okay? Then you have secondary optics. Many of these optics, any camera people in the audience, optics are very expensive, aren't they? Good quality optics. Many of these aquarium fixtures that are available in our industry, they're using polycarbonates and things like that. If you look at the efficiency of polycarbonate, it's about 85%. So right there, you, you're losing 15% of your output. Not to mention, there's what we call the air gap interface, and that's a fancy word for where the optic meets the LED lens. If you look at things like refraction and other things like that, there's more loss right there. So see what's starting to happen to that perfect light source? As we start implementing or installing it, we're losing a lot of light. Let alone, most of the light produced in an LED never even makes it out of the LED itself. Okay, and that's where we get into the efficacy, what I call efficacy or lumens per watt um, regarding light sources. And the other problem there is the over, before I get into the next line, when discussing light, and this is why this stuff is so important, we have to understand how we're comparing things. See, if we were to talk in terms of lumens, for example, that's visible light, and that's based on human eye perception. That's one thing. So we can't conveniently talk about lumens and then switch to something else when we're trying to compare light sources. And I'll give you an example. Let's take a metal halide light source and let's take an LED light source. This has nothing to do with which light source is better. We're just sticking to the facts here. Is it a fair statement to say that in our imaginary LED fixture, at least half of the light emitting diodes used would be blue or other colors, right? They're gonna be blue or other colors. The other half, let's say they're white. So if we were to look at this in terms of luminous efficacy, we could say even if we created an average, we're gonna use the, the, the figure of 100. Most LEDs come in at around 100, 110, maybe 130 lumens per watt. But here's the catch. <coughs> That's only white LEDs. Once you go to blue LEDs, for example, royal blue and other LEDs like that, their output is often expressed in milliwatts, not even lumens, okay? But if you were to put a lumen value on there, it would actually be considerably lower than the white LED. So now, if half the LEDs are on average of half little more of the luminous efficacy of the white LED, when we start adding up all these LEDs, what happens? Our, luminous, our total luminous efficacy goes down, doesn't it? Right? We're not at 100 anymore or 130. We might be, conservatively, we might be at 80 or 90 total luminous efficacy of this system. Well, here's the interesting thing about this metal halide lamp. Most of the energy, there's gonna be loss, like with any other light source, but the light being produced, it all has the same luminous efficacy. So if the efficacy of this halide lamp is, let's say, 90 lumens per watt, because the newer metal halide lamps are a lot better than people give them credit for. I don't know if the folks from Ushio are here in the audience, but they can attest to this. There we go, we got Ushio over there. Is it fair to say that metal halide lamps have gotten a lot better since years ago? There you go, that's from Ushio themselves. So my point is, we have 90 lumens here, and we have 90 lumens there. I'm not saying which one is better, but I'm just saying that all this stuff about this or that, no, that has nothing to do with it. And before I move on, because I know we're crunched with time, with LEDs, where's my LED users? Again, just raise your hand, please, real quick, one second. How many of you people are led to believe, well, I shouldn't say led to believe, but you, you do not dial up your LED fixtures to 100%, is that correct? Most of you don't dial up your, you don't dial up your LED fixtures to 100% because you might burn the tips of your corals. And this leads you to believe 
This leads you to believe that that's because LEDs are so much more powerful. Is that a fair statement? Eh. Here's what's happening, guys. If we were outside in the sun, having a nice conversation, everything's fine. If I took a magnifying glass and put it on your arm, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get burned, right? Well, here's my question. Has the energy from the sun changed? No. Energy is energy. It cannot be created. So if you're looking at actual energy or optical energy, it still requires X amount of force to achieve X amount of output, okay? Now, back to this metal halide lamp, here's where things start to get a little, and, and keep in mind, guys, I'm not favoring metal halide lamps, I'm just laying out the facts, because I spent most of my career working on LEDs. Okay, that's all I'm trying to say. So with this halide lamp, there's an interesting thing. It also produces a lot of UV that these LEDs cannot. If you, look up LED, if you were to look up UV, true UV LEDs, 365 nanometer and the likes, one, they're very expensive, two, they deteriorate a lot quicker than other LEDs, and there's a reason for this, and if you were to really start utilizing higher levels of UV in these LED systems and or fixtures, they'd completely have to change the optics, the lenses, and things like that, because they would start to degrade. What happens to our dashboard in the sun? Plastics, all these things start to degrade. So again, there's more to the picture than meets the eye. So if we look at light in energy terms, because the shorter the wavelength, and basically that's the lower the wavelength, but the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy level. So a photon at let's say 365 nanometers has considerably more energy than a photon at let's say 470. So while we might see one thing, if we were looking at energy levels, you see how things start to change? So with lighting, the key is, is balance. A simple rule of thumb, the hotter a fixture system is, including LEDs, the less efficient it is. Remember we discussed energy produced by a light source. Heat means loss, whether it's from a light, that is getting trapped in the fixture itself because that's another thing, the treatment of light. Okay, T5, where's my T5 users? For my T5 users, if your lamp is getting over 35C, your output is dropping exponentially. So if your T5 fixture is really hot, get some more fans on it and you'll actually improve your output as well as increase your lamp life. Okay, lastly, before we move on, it seems the fixation on wattage has reared its head once again regarding the output of LEDs. While we have already covered the principles of wattage and light, wattage of an LED only indicates the amount of power, maximum power, that that LED can handle before permanent damage or complete failure will occur. It is not an indicator of light produced when compared to other LEDs. Because remember we talked about how certain conditions have to exist, and depending on those conditions, this can affect the output of your light source considerably. The amount of light produced is determined by the LED's efficiency or luminous efficacy, as well as the overall efficiency of the fixture system it is housed in. Don't worry guys, we're getting to the good stuff. This leads us to the other half of our comparison, which is photometric output, and here's where we're gonna have some fun. Simply put, the photometric output of a light source is the amount of visible light it produces. This is usually expressed as luminous flux, lumen, lux, even foot candles, and is based on human eye response. With the growing popularity of LEDs, some of you may have heard the term lumen when it used expressing the output of an LED. This is a photometric measurement of light and is typically used to express the visible intensity of light produced by the light source. Oh, come on. 
Here we go. Now, while lumens gives us the visible intensity of light, some might ask, why, not, why haven't we been using lumens all along? Considering what we've already discussed about radiometric output, using lumens would be a lot better than watts, but this still does not give us the complete picture. Remember, we're simply talking about visible intensity. Have we discussed anything about suitability for our aquaria? No, we have not. This is because lumen has nothing to do with the photosynthetic nature of light produced. Come on. While lumens is, indicate the visible intensity of a light source, it is based on human eye response as we discussed. Light meters measuring the brightness of a light source at 555 nanometers, that's where they're calibrated. So here's the thing. <coughs> you can use lumens or lux, and with a simple formula, you can look it up. You can calculate, roughly calculate your PAR. But here's the problem. If you look at the response of a light meter, you would see a peak like this peaking at 555 nanometer. The reason why you might look at, let's say, an apogee PAR meter or something of the likes is because the response of that PAR sensor is flatter. So you're getting a more accurate picture of the total photon flux density, if you will. Okay, so that's, that, that's the pros and cons. You can use a light meter, you can roughly calculate the PAR, but the reason why it's still not really recommended is because of the way the individual sensors process the light being received. So the PAR sensor is actually a lot more accurate. Many corals and invertebrates need very specific wavelengths of light to thrive, grow, and even reproduce. To compound matters, many corals and invertebrates have different absorption response, which can make them sensitive to certain wavelengths of light. So as you can see, we still need more information than visible light or intensity alone. Other lighting terms you might be familiar with, such as CRI, also tell us little about the spectral composition of light. I've been seeing some drabs here and some talkings, if you will, of CRI on some of the board. Let's not go there, guys. CRI is not what we want. You have your raw values, okay? With CRI, they take eight of those raw values out of the 14, and guess what? They take the highest ones, and then they average those together to give us a CRI. Now, here's the interesting point. Are we basing it CRI on sunlight, or are we basing it on a standardized light source? You see how we're starting to get pretty vague here? And if you look at those R values or raw values, you'll see that a lot of the colors they represent have nothing to do with what we're doing. Okay, so again, we're starting to get, you know, away from what we'd like. When it comes to photometric output of light, I can go on and on listing the various measurements used to measure and categorize light. But for our purposes, the two primary measurements that will probably be most useful are spectral power distribution and PAR. Now, before I leave CRI real quickly, like Kelvin, you can have two different light sources, and depending on how they're measured, have nearly identical CRI. So again, that's one of the reasons why we don't want to get caught up in that trap as well. So here we go. Now, come on. Okay, of all the lighting terms we've discussed, so far PAR, photosynthetically act active radiation, is by and large the most popular. For many of you who, you know, for many who may not be familiar with this, PAR came about, I believe, right around 1971, and it was used, get this, to replace foot candles when measuring energy from the sun and other light sources for horticultural use. Now, here's the interesting thing. Do I, I, I believe, is, is there an Apogee guy in the audience by any chance? Any Apogee people? Okay, if you're using your Apogee meter, you'll notice there's two settings. One is for sunlight, and one is for electric. Has anyone ever wondered what those set, settings are for? Because if you're measuring electric light sources, you should be using the electric light setting. But here's the interesting thing. I believe they still do this. When they calibrate the meters, it's calibrated to T5 lights. 
And if you start doing some of the, you know, if you really start doing some researching, depending on the light source that you are testing, there is often a correction factor. There is often a correction factor. So when you're measuring your light sources utilizing PAR, it's very important that you're using the right settings and looking up some of this other information. I would like to add, while PAR is probably the most popular measurement of light for the purpose of evaluating light sources in our industry, and I use our industry heavily there, it is far from perfect. The best way to help you visualize this would be if you took a high pressure sodium lamp for hydrophonics and often used for commercial use and measure its PAR value. You would get very impressive PAR reading, but it does not mean you would want to put that lamp over your reef aquarium. Now, unfortunately, because I'm confined for space here, I have my PAR meter here with me. And if I took my fancy schmancy laser pointer and pointed it at my PAR meter, I would get a very high PAR value. So, based on that, I can take 20 or 30 of these and strap them together and we should be good to go, right? It doesn't work that way. Okay, PAR, the bottom line is, tells us nothing about the spectral composition of light. Tells us absolutely nothing. And if you go to the Apogee website, even they will tell you this. If you're going to be comparing the spectral quality or composition of a light source, the only way to do that is, in fact, with a spectrometer. And before I forget, because sometimes I have a habit of going all over the place, a lot of people use PAR to calculate PER, right? We've, we've seen a lot of that, people using PAR to calculate PER. So here's my question. One, corals respond to light differently, right? So depending on what types of corals we're talking about, they kind of, you know, they kind of respond to light differently depending on the depth they're collected, so on and so forth. But here's the interesting thing that I want you to consider for a minute. If they're using PER, photosynthetically usable radiation, love that term, if they're using PER and they're calculating it based on PAR, if PAR tells us nothing about the spectral composition of the source, then how the heck can we determine the amount of photosynthetically usable radiation we're actually receiving? It doesn't work. You're using, you're using something to calculate something else, but that something we're using tells us nothing about the spectral composition. This is because the spectral power, dis spectral power distribution, based on our earlier conversation of an HPS lamp, is totally different than a lamp used for reef aquarium use. In any case, while PAR gives you the amount of photosynthetically active radiation produced in the visible region, Spectral power distribution or spectral intensity tells you where it is coming from. I actually have my spectrometer here with me. Again, I was hoping to set it up, but we don't have much room here, so unfortunately I cannot do that. Come on. All right, here we go. Here's an example, and, and actually this is an artistic rendering. It's a horrible photo. Actually, I have more sp accurate spectral data, but I was crunched for time, so I just kind of use this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back so you can take the picture there. All right, here we go. What makes SPD so useful to aquarists? It represents spectral composition or energy of a light source being individual wavelengths or bands. Now with spectral power distribution, there's about eight bands that it's broken up into. So you have your red, green, yellow, blue, and violet regions, and it can give you a good estimation of that light source and its usefulness for our application. Seeing as how photosynthetically active radiation PAR is a measurement of energy of photons in the 400 to 700 nanometer region, or in many cases, 800 nanometers, it seems we may be onto something here. Spectral, power dis spectral distribution chart is a representation of the light spectrum produced by a light source. Now, we're almost done here, guys. We're wrapping this up, but I gotta get, how many people have heard the term color spectrum? For those of you who might be interested, those words don't even belong in the same sentence. As we start to discuss spectral composition, which is a representation of all wavelengths being produced by the light source, 
Can we describe the spectrum in any one word? No, we cannot. Color is one thing, spectrum is something else entirely. So if you happen to be speaking to somebody and they use the term color spectrum, you might want to put them on to what we've learned here today. But those, and, and this is the thing, I want to get away from all of the hype. Color spectrum, this, that, and the other. Spectrum is one thing, color is something else entirely. There's color science. There's many different areas, if you will, or disciplines in lighting, and color science has a science all unto itself, which many of you photographers may be familiar with. But anyway, it's a graph showing the relative intensities of a light source at each wavelength. Now here's where it gets cool. You can use these charts to compare the energy levels of various light sources used for coral or plant growth. As you will see, it's the most practical way to compare the quality of light created for use with Reef Aquaria. The chart shows exactly which wavelengths of light measured in nanometers the corals are receiving. The highest energy output of the source is plotted as 100% relative energy. The 100% peak, if you went to that chart that we showed earlier, is used to compare the energy levels of all other wavelengths of light produced by that light source. So simply put, if we can get there, simply put, the bottom of the chart shows all of the wavelengths of visible light energy that the light source produces. For example, if a wavelength is at 50% relative energy, that peak has half the energy when compared to the 100% peak. Scaling the chart to 100% relative energy allows side-by-side -side comparison of light sources with different lumen ratings, intensity, or wattages. See, spectral intensity or spectral composition, spectral power distribution, it doesn't care if it's an LED, a metal halide, it's just looking strictly at the spectral data and the intensity of light produced at these individual wavelengths. The key is determining the ability or suitability of a light source in promoting photosynthesis in specific organisms. Come on. Okay, here we go. The bottom line is, is while a light source may render a high par reading, its suitability for reef aquarium use is still not certain. I think we're, I think we're at the home, okay. While spectral power distribution and par theoretically can work hand in hand with each other, it is important not to get their purpose confused. So, if you happen to know the spectral composition of your light source, then you can use PAR to monitor coarsely the performance of that light source and its degradation. That's one of the reasons why I use one of the uh, PMK PAR sensors from Apex, I believe it is, because I can log over time. I really don't care about the specific number, but it allows me to, to, to determine when I may want to start considering replacing my metal halide lamp. Spectral power distribution or composition is absolute. In any case, while PAR gives you the amount of photosynthetically active radiation produced in the visible region, which may or may not be beneficial to corals in the case of reef aquaria, spectral power distribution or even better spectral intensity tells you where it's coming from. The main problem with the PAR meter is that it measures the total number of photons in the visual region simultaneously and does not discern between them. In my professional opinion, the performance and quality of reef lighting product should never be based on color, brightness, or PAR alone. Spectral power distribution composition completes the circle and when used in conjunction with PAR, gives you an accurate picture of the light you're placing over your reef or planted aquaria. So, we're gonna close this now, but I had a hobbyist ask me one time about blue light produced by a 20K metal halide lamp compared to a radium. Here's the other interesting thing to leave here. The answer lies in the eye of the beholder. Our vision is unique to us. In this sense, our scotopic and photopic vision, normal to intense light levels, is almost as unique per individual as fingerprints themselves. Thank you, guys.